Let's talk about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So I think you will all agree with me that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is one of the most popular pieces of classical music, but I would even go as far as saying that just the four opening bars are the most popular four bars in classical music ever. But even though it's been played, it's been performed and conducted a million times, there is still so many different interpretations, so many different performances. So today I thought I will focus on just those four opening bars. I will show you all the different things that are open to interpretation, all the different things that are not, and I will exemplify everything with different conductors that took sometimes very, very opposite decisions. If you're new here, my name is Anna and I'm an orchestra conductor and that is why I'm devoting a whole video to just four bars of music, but you will see that there's a reason. Okay, so I'm going to break this down in sort of three parts and the first part is going to be about tempo. What did Beethoven write? What did he want? Here it says Allegro con brio which is you know Allegro with a lot of this just very enthusiastic Allegro and the metronome marking is 108 for the whole bar. So let me get my trusty metronome to show you guys what 108 is. So that is 108, that is for the whole bar. What I mean by this is that the piece is written in two fours, so two beats per bar. But because this is so fast paced, it's usually conducted in one, meaning instead of showing both of the beats in the bar, you just show sort of the first one and you keep going because otherwise it would be very busy. And this is supported by how Beethoven writes this metronome because he says, I 108 for the whole bar, not for each pulse, which makes us conductors think, oh, he is really thinking in bar units. So first I'm gonna play you two very radically different decisions on the tempo, and then we're gonna talk about why that happens. The first one is by Gardiner, and he pretty much follows the metronome indication that is written. one is by Pierre Boulez and you will see. Yep, that's that's pretty different. The thing is that for the longest time, Beethoven's metronomes were believed to be inaccurate. People thought that his metronome was defected. There are a lot, a lot of theories, a lot of research. I really, A, don't know that enough and B, wouldn't even have the time if I wanted to, to break all of that down. But all you need to know is that for a long time, it was debated whether those metronomes should be followed or not. Nowadays, we're collectively moving towards sort of giving those metronomes a chance and seeing where that takes us. And for Beethoven's fifth, that is pretty much the speed that you heard Gardiner perform at. Now, the second big issue or big thing to note in this beginning is the fermata, the pause that is written. So if we take a look at the score, after the eighth note, we have the long note. And the long note has what is called a fermata on top, which just means hold this note until you don't want to hold it anymore. That is pretty straightforward. It's just going to be a matter of the conductor or the ensemble deciding on the length of that note, the end. But if you look at the second ba -ba -ba -bam, you will see that it's not written the same way. Instead of just landing after the eighth notes in another half note that just has a fermata, it lands into a normal half note that is slurred, that is linked in sound, that continues into a half note with a fermata. So what's the most common interpretation of what Beethoven meant by this is, well, possibly he just wanted the second long note to be held longer than the first one. And instead of writing, you know, hold for longer with words or something like that, which wasn't really done at the time, he just made sure that that held note was slurred to another figure to indicate, well, this one's longer. So to illustrate all that I've been saying, I'm gonna show you two different recordings. Now, because this is kind of subtle, I am going to add a timer or something like that to time both of the long notes within themselves. So what we're trying to see is whether the conductor decided that both long notes should be one longer than the other or doesn't matter. So for Karayan, if we see it timed, both long notes last about the same. <laughs> the 
contrary, if I show you a battle's decision, even though it is subtle, and it should be subtle, because it's not like there's a million half notes slurred to a fermata, it's just one. But you will see with the timer that the second one does last longer than the first one. Now, before I get to my third point, which is about conducting this, I do want to add one more thing about the fermatas and show you a pretty crazy example, which is that sometimes some conductors might consider that the length of that fermata, of that long note, instead of being completely random, should sort of enter in the big scheme of how the whole movement is structured. The movement is roughly structured every four bars. The musical phrases last four bars. I'm gonna play you a little bit of it and show you with a score. So for some conductors that initial fermata kind of enters in a, you know, let's make it last four bars, give or take. Of course it should not be anything mathematical or metronomic because it's supposed to be, you know, hold it as much as you want. But I'm going to show you this recording by Bruno Valta and you will see that really we're all sort of holding it to something that makes sense within the scheme because Bruno Valta did not do that and to me it sounded very shocking. Here you go. I mean, hey, Bruno Valta, Bruno Valta was Mahler's student, so he, he, he's fine. Now, and lastly, I want to talk about conducting this opening. What are the challenges or is there anything there that conductors can interpret differently? I would say there are sort of two things to consider and to illustrate this, I'm going to first play you a version by Kleiber. <laughs> So the first thing that I want to discuss about that clip is that if you notice, Cliver with his left hand does a count in. He does a count in, which is actually on a on a big scheme of thinking about this four bar phrases because he counts one, two, three, and pa 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 pa. Watch it again. a personal choice by Cliver is not something that's written it's not even something that is taught at like conducting school barely any conductor does it but I wanted to show that to illustrate there's a reason why he does that and it's because this is a very hard movement to begin to set the tempo for many many reasons one of them being that it's a very start and stop movement usually you give an impulse and then you you know you give a couple of more and then the orchestra you sort of enter in a tempo, but here you give one impulse and then you're you're done, you're holding the note. It also has to do with starting with an eighth note silence, which makes those short notes sound like a pickup and it, all those things are kind of hard to show. That is why Cliver decides to show three beats ahead to go like, okay, this is the pulse guys. And then the orchestra is already sort of in the loop of what the tempo is. But like I said, that's actually very rare. And it's even rarer for Cliver because he's usually not that technical in how he shows things. And the second thing that he shows, which is an extremely sort of technical, you know, conducting school thing that I haven't seen many professional conductors with professional orchestra show, is that extra bar which is slurred to the second fermata. What do I mean by all of this? If you have a fermata, if you have a long note, as a conductor you land there and you show hold, 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 hold until you decide to leave that note. And ultimately, because it's your judgment as a conductor of how long those notes should be, it doesn't really matter that the second one has that extra note and that extra slur, you could, and most do, just show, okay, pa 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 pa, hold, and then the second one, pa 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 pa, and you just hold a bit longer because you know about the stuff we've mentioned. But what Cliver does, if you pay attention, is once he lands in the second fermata, he does a very sort of small, dead, what we call neutral gesture to show, hey guys, ta 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 ta, here is that half note slurred into the long one. He technically shows us that there is that extra bar 
between the second long note and the first one. Now, to be honest, this is not shown at all. I'm very surprised that he did that again, because ultimately, like I said, there is no difference in sound or in what the musicians are going to do. Regardless you showing them that extra bar or not, they're still gonna wait for you to leave that fermata. There's no difference in that sense. That gesture is what we conductors, like I said, called neutral bars. And that's usually used in opera when there are like, let's say, orchestras have four bars of silence while the, sing while the singer sings and then they come back and instead of as a conductor showing nothing and then going, okay, here we are again, you just kind of show, okay, one bar, two bars, three bars, even though there's no music happening, that's why, that's why they're called neutral because you're not like enthusiastically conducting silence. You're just showing it so that musicians that are sitting there can keep count and come back in without being, you know, so tense as to where are we. So it's rare that he shows that, but it's good for me because I can exemplify this to you. And also I, again, love how random that is. You know, there's like actual really complicated technical things that he doesn't show in other places and that he just lets them play. And then here there's something like no one really needs and he shows it. So it's like, I don't know, you do you, Cliver. So I hope this was interesting. Let me know if you have any other questions or if you have a favorite Beethoven fifth recording or if it appear at a Bugs Bunny, I don't know, anything Beethoven fifth related, you can write it in the comments and I will see you next time.